Luke 4, starting in verse 16, says, Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. On the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. Do you see that Jesus was in the habit of worshiping every week? Oh, you didn't hear me. I'm sorry. Jesus was in the habit of going to worship every week. It was his custom to go to the synagogue on the Sabbath. You still didn't hear me. <laughs> Jesus went to worship every week. Okay, you heard me. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You can't help but listen to those words and not be moved, can you? It's something that just touches your spirit, touches you at a level that's even deeper than your mind when you read those words. Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of them, and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? But Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself, and you will tell me, Do here in your hometown what you did in Capernaum. Truly I tell you, he continued, No prophet, no prophet is accepted in his own hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel, in Elijah's time, when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine, yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow of Zarephath, a Gentile widow. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha, the prophet, yet none of them was cleansed, only Naaman, the Syrian, another Gentile. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove Jesus out of the town, and took him to the, pr the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him over the cliff. But he walked away through the crowd. All right, now, since Jesus talked about Naaman, turn with me to 2 Kings 5, and I'll meet you there, and, and let's read about Naaman the leper. 2 Kings 5, and beginning in verse 1. Now, Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him, the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl said, and by all means, the king of Aram replied, I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you may cure him of leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of leprosy? See, he's trying to pick a fight with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent a message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out and greet one such as I and stand and call on the name of his Lord, the Lord his God and wave his hand over the spot and cure me of leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, far better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash there and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some big thing, wouldn't you have done it? 
How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So Naaman went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all of his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. Please accept a gift from your servant. The prophet answered, as surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept anything. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. If you will not, said Naaman, please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry, for your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other god but the Lord. But may the Lord forgive your servant this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Rimmon to go bow down, and he is leaning on my arm, and I have to go there also, when I bow down in the temple of Rimmon, may the Lord forgive your servant for this. Go in peace, Elisha said. All right, let's pray, and then let's receive the word of the Lord. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the people you love so much, and for your presence here with us. Father, today we join our hearts together, and we lift up Ron's family before you, especially his 12-year-old son, Lord, who's just experienced the trauma of losing his father without any warning, Lord, without any indication. Father, I pray that the peace of God and the comfort of the Holy Spirit would descend on that little boy. I pray that the strength of God, Lord, would fill him. Lord, we pray for Ron's parents. We pray for his extended family members. Lord, everyone affected by the loss. We pray for his co-workers, the men who worked beside him and worked underneath his leadership. Father, we pray for the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we pray that, Father, this, this sudden death would cause them to lift their eyes to heaven and set their minds on eternal things, Lord. Now, Father, as we look into your word, we pray that we would encounter your presence while we receive your word. If your heart agrees with that, would you say amen and amen. I wonder, have you ever had a bad day at church? My friend Vinny Scarisi, who went home to be with the Lord last summer, used to send me texts on Sunday afternoons. If I look at you, I'm going to cry. When church was especially good, he would send me a text that said, Good church day. I miss Vinny and I miss his texts. But unfortunately, not all church days are good. Some of you miss the good old days when we had special music every Sunday and <clears throat> not all of it was so special. Uh, I think maybe the worst thing that I ever saw in church was when Denise and I were living in Springfield, Missouri and during the announcements, an elderly man passed away in the service and he fell right off the end of the pew into the aisle. It was awful. The pastor looked and saw what happened and he immediately gave an altar call and he said, you never know when God might call for you and young people poured out of the balconies to, to I'm telling you the truth, to get right with Jesus. I've heard horror stories of fist fights during church meetings. I've never seen that. I pray I never do. But in Nazareth, Jesus had a very bad day at synagogue. Now, I've had lots of people walk out during my sermons because they didn't like what they were hearing. That's a spiritual thing. But the congregation in Nazareth got so angry with Jesus that they carried him to the brow of the cliff and tried to throw him over. Now, that is a bad day. Looking at the story, things actually started out quite well. Everyone was glued to Jesus. They were all paying undivided attention. Everyone was amazed by Jesus' message. They were surprised that the hometown boy they knew could speak like this so far so good. But Jesus, being a prophet, discerned their thoughts. He discerned the real state of their hearts, and he confronted them for their lack of faith. He, he compared the congregation at Nazareth with the people living in the lowest point of Israel's history. During the ministry of Elisha and Elijah, the, the faith of Israel was so anemic that their faith was surpassed by a Lebanese widow and a Syrian general. During his earthly ministry, Jesus commended just two people for having great faith or mega faith. We've talked about them. One was a Roman centurion and, and one was a Lebanese mom on a mission. 
In Nazareth, Jesus recommended two more people as examples of faith that receives. Ironically, both of them also Gentiles, a Lebanese widow and a Syrian general. We've been looking at stories of faith together for a while. We've been talking about the heroes of the Bible and considering the defining moments of faith in their lives. We've been learning from them. We've been drawing encouragement from them. You see, as a congregation, we've come to our own defining moment of faith. Just a couple of weeks away now from moving into our new sanctuary, a dream that started more than 20 years ago. I want you to know that the Lord has done absolute miracles for us. Going into the fall last fall, we were about $1.1 or $1.2 million cash away from finishing the new building. Because of your sacrificial giving and because the Lord has really miraculously helped us. Do you notice how I pray every Sunday, Lord, take these loaves and fishes and multiply them to, to be more? God literally has done that for us. Because of your giving and because of God's working, $1.1 or $1.2 million has shrunk down to just 40000 to finish the sanctuary. <laughs> Beloved, that's a miracle. You see, you don't realize how big of a miracle it is because you haven't gone to bed every night for the last six months with $1.2 million on your brain. Now... 40000 to finish the sanctuary. There's some stuff that doesn't include. We, we need some fabric acoustic panels around the room. They're not cheap. Um, there's some equipment that, that won't be in the sanctuary when we first moved in that, that we will need to do. But, but it will be finished. We can move into it, start using it. We were over a half million dollars away from finishing the lower level. And that price now is just a little under $100,000. So the Lord has done great, great, great things for us. Yeah, come on, somebody give him a praise for that. We've come this far by faith and we'll finish by faith. So that's why we've been feeding our faith with the word of God. The Bible says it is by grace we are saved through faith. Looking at the story of Naaman the leper, I see three things that he shows us about Faith that receives grace. And I want to talk about it with you quickly. Faith that receives grace. Three things that Naaman shows us. First of all, Naaman shows us that faith is the believing that comes before the receiving. Faith is the believing that comes before the receiving. The difference between the Nazareth congregation and Naaman is that they wanted to see a sign in order to believe, but Naaman believed first and so saw a sign. Jesus stands in front of the Nazareth congregation and he announces all the wonderful things that he has come to do. He announces good news to the poor. That, that means to people with all and any kind of need. He, he has come to give sight to the blind. That means people who have never seen miracles will see them. He's come to release captives. That, that means people who are held in the grip of sin. People who are bound by addiction. People who are living with the enemy's harassment will be set free. Free. He's come to remove people out from under the judgment of God and move them into the favor of God. The Nazareth congregation was impressed at first, but they weren't persuaded. By the Holy Spirit, Jesus could read their thoughts. They wanted to see a sign before they put their trust in Jesus. That little proverb, physician, heal yourself, it means heal your own. We've heard, Jesus, about the miracles that you did in Capernaum. Now heal your own Nazareth family. Heal your own folk. Let's see some proof, Jesus. But you see, that's not the faith that receives grace. Faith that receives grace is faith that goes first. It trusts God before it receives. That was the faith of Naaman the Syrian general. Naaman was the top military officer in Syria. He was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The Bible says he was important, he was noble, he was valiant. He was highly esteemed by his boss, King 
Ben-Hadad and by all the people. The Bible also says, listen to this, the Bible also says that God gave Naaman military success against the Jewish people. Now you want to talk about a wrinkle in this story. God enabled Naaman, the uncircumcised Syrian, to defeat God's own beloved covenant people. Beloved, everybody listen to this. If you're not faithful to the Lord, he will take the victories that were meant to be yours and he will give them to your enemy. That's precisely what happened in Elijah's day. Naaman received the healing miracle that the Jewish people could have received. That's what happened in Jesus' day. Gentiles got the healing miracles that the Nazarenes could have received. One of the implicit messages in this passage is that there are a whole lot of miracles that simply go unclaimed by God's people because we don't trust him for them. That's good preaching right there. Naaman had everything going for him, but isn't it amazing how one little conjunction can ruin everything? Naaman had it all. He had success. He had esteem. He had God's favor on his side. He had greatness. He had wealth, but Naaman had a problem. He had a skin disease that was disfiguring and disgusting. And ultimately deadly. Naaman's one little conjunction, his one little butt, cast a long shadow over his entire life. Instead of being the objects of everyone's envy, that that one little conjunction made Naaman the object of everyone's pity. It overshadowed all of his outstanding accomplishments. When people thought of Naaman, it's all they could think about. Mm, Too bad for him. Maybe you know what it's like to have one little conjunction in your life that's messing up everything. Everything would be great right now, but I have this diagnosis. Everything would be great right now, but I have this financial need. Everything would be great right now, but my son, my daughter is in trouble. Everything would be great right now, but... This relationship I have, it's it's unraveling. Everything would be great right now, but I can't quit this one thing that's harmful to me and is dragging me down. Beloved, listen, life is way too short to live with one little conjunction overshadowing everything else good that God has done. Jesus came to announce good news. He came to announce healing and freedom, favor in place of judgment. Don't let the miracle that could be yours be given away to someone else. Follow Naaman's lead. It's bad enough that God gave Naaman military success against the Jewish people, but we read further that Naaman was conducting terror raids on Israel. One can only imagine the brutality of these raids. War is a very ugly business. Adults were murdered, the men first and then the women after they were violated. Towns were burned down, livestock and valuables were stolen, and children were abducted and made into slaves. During one raid, Naaman captured a little Jewish girl whom he brought home to his wife. It's a testament to both the character of Naaman and the character of the little girl that when she heard that her master was sick, she offered a helpful suggestion. She had been treated kindly in Naaman's house and she overcame bitterness and she offered a word that would save Naaman's life. If only my master would see the prophet in Samaria, he would cure him. When Naaman heard that word, there was a spark of faith that ignited inside of his heart. He inquired further and he took a risk. Faith that receives grace takes risks even before it receives. Naaman went to his boss and he asked permission to seek healing from the prophet of Yahweh. Ben-Hadad was a devotee of Rimen, the god of thunder. Naaman was taking a risk by suggesting to the king that Yahweh could do something that Rimen could not. 
Amazingly, Ben-Hadad agrees. He writes a letter to King Jehoram and he sends Naaman to Israel with a royal gift. 15,000 troy ounces of silver. In today's market, that's about a half million dollars worth. 3,000 troy ounces of gold worth about 4 million today. In the Bible, it says 10 changes of clothes. What that means is 10 bolts of fabric. Julie, if you know your fabrics, damask was invented by the Syrians. So this was a valuable commodity in today's market, probably about $30,000 worth of damask fabric. The sheer size of the gift says so much. It shows how powerful the Syrians were, far more powerful than Israel. It shows how much Ben-Hadad loved Naaman. He was willing to spend a fortune to cure his general. It shows how serious Naaman's illness was. This was critical. But listen, more than anything, listen, listen, listen to this. It shows how confident Naaman and Ben-Hadad were that Yahweh's prophet could do the job. Based on the word of a little Jewish girl, they were convinced that Yahweh had the power and they never saw anything. Ben-Hadad sends four and a half million dollars to Jehoram with a letter. Dear Jerry, Naaman is sick. Heal him. Best regards, Ben. When King Jehoram reads the letter, he falls to pieces. What am I going to do? Am I God that I can save him? He's convinced that Ben-Hadad is just looking for an occasion to make war. So listen, here is a pagan king and a general who have more faith in Yahweh than a Jewish king. Jehoram had seen God perform miracles through Elisha, yet he did not believe. Naaman and Ben-Hadad had not seen anything yet, and yet they believed. And so they received a miracle that no one else in Israel did. You see, that is faith that receives grace. It is the believing that comes before the receiving. Faith that receives grace. Three things Naaman shows us. Faith is the believing that comes before the receiving. Second, faith is the believing that goes beyond all reason. Faith is the believing that goes beyond all reason. When Elisha caught wind of the situation, he sent message to Jehoram. He said, why are you panicking? Send Naaman to me. Oh, that God would give us such a walk, such a fellowship with him that we could say with the confidence of Elisha, send him to us. Sickness, send him to us. Disease, send him to us. Cancer, send him to us. Terminal, send him to us. Bound by addiction, send him to us. Tormented by the enemy, send him to us. I'm preaching better than you're listening just now. I just wanted to point that out. So off Naaman goes with his horses and chariots to Gilead. Must have been quite the procession. How many carts does it take to transport over a thousand pounds of gold and silver and hundreds of pounds of fabric? How large of a security force would you send with four and a half million dollars? How many attendants would a man of Naaman's importance require? I'm sure that Naaman's convoy dwarfed Elisha's front door. Both now and then, royal visitors demand the utmost respect. Elisha being inferior to Naaman and serving an inferior king was expected to come out and bow down, but Naaman was about to learn that Elisha was a servant of the king of kings. Rather than coming out to receive Naaman, Elisha sends a messenger. Go dip in the Jordan River seven times and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. That is all. (laughs) Ta-ta. Naaman is infuriated to be treated like that. He had four and a half million dollars and a letter from the king. He wanted the opportunity to show Elisha how much he was willing to pay for his miracle. He rode off in a huff, muttering under his breath. I thought for sure 
He'd come out and greet one such as I. I I thought he would call on the name of the Lord and wave his hands in the air. Wash in the filthy Jordan. We have better rivers in Syria. Another testament to the character of Naaman is that a servant bravely speaks up. I don't know whether you've ever interrupted a general when he's mad, but it's not advisable. (laughs) Nevertheless, the servant pleaded with Naaman, my father, you see, it's a testament to Naaman's character. My father, if he had told you to do some big thing, wouldn't you have done it? So why not do this one simple thing? You see, faith that receives grace makes the spirit broken and the heart open. Why did Elisha treat Naaman the way he did? Elisha wasn't trying to be rude, but he needed to confront Naaman's pride. As noble a man as Naaman was, he struggled with pride just like we all do. Naaman came looking for a healing, but he wasn't looking for a handout. He had money. He could pay his own way. He wanted a miracle without sacrificing his dignity. Naaman came looking for a healing on his own terms. He had expectations about how the miracle should come about. He had expectations about how it should go down. And when his expectations were not met, he went away angry. Listen to me. Naaman was needy. But he was not broken. Everybody look at me. Look at, look, at, look at me. There's one thing I've learned in over 25 years of ministry. It's that you can be flat broke and still not broken. You can be on your last leg and still not surrendered, not yielded to God. You can be all out of options. You can be all out of time and still be self-reliant and defiant to the very end. Naaman was angry. Do you know that the gospel makes people angry? It made Naaman angry. It made the congregation at Nazareth angry. And it still makes people angry today. Jesus promised us that it would. Over the last 20 years, there's a movement that has caught on in the church that's built on a faulty premise. The premise is, If we only say the gospel nice enough, it won't make people angry. Lovely thought that, but it's absolutely untrue. Jesus said they hated me for telling the truth, and they'll hate you too. The gospel makes people angry because just as with Naaman, it confronts our pride. The gospel says there is nothing that you nor I could do to earn the miracle of salvation. The gospel makes people angry because it leaves absolutely no room whatsoever for self-righteousness. There's no offering you or I could bring. There's no sacrifice you or I could make. There's no service we could render. There is no earthly accomplishment or position that could make us worthy to receive grace. That's why it's called grace. Though you be the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff with a four and a half million dollar reward in your hand standing at the door of Yahweh's prophet, you are just an empty handed beggar. The gospel makes people angry because it prescribes humility and people don't like that. People would rather be self-sufficient than indebted to God. They'd rather pay a price and set their own terms then accept God's surrender unconditionally but you cannot pay for God's saving help you can only get on your knees and humbly ask for it one of my favorite writers R. Kent Hughes tells of a church service in England one day during communion an esteemed judge was kneeling at the communion rail and right next to him was an ex-convict who was only recently set free from prison. The the two men, the judge and the ex-con, they they took communion side by side on their knees. After communion, the convict greeted the judge and he said, do you remember me? He said, you sent me to prison. And he said, "I, I found faith there. I found Christ there. 
after the church service, the judge and the pastor were talking about it in the pastor's study. And the judge recounted the story, and the judge said, what a miracle of grace. And the pastor quickly agreed. But the judge said, to whom do you refer? The pastor said, why, the convict, of course. The judge said, I wasn't referring to him, I was thinking of myself. You see, it's not surprising that the criminal received God's grace in jail. He had nothing but a history of crime and brokenness. And when he heard that Jesus could be his savior, he knew he needed help. I was taught from earliest childhood to live as a gentleman. That my word is my bond to say my prayers, go to church, take communion. I went through Oxford. I obtained my degrees. I was called to the bar and then I became a judge. Listen, I was sure that I was all that I needed to be when in fact I was a sinner. Pastor, it's God's grace that drew me. It's God's grace that opened my heart to receive Christ. I am the greater miracle. The gospel makes people angry because it is so simple that it defies logic. The gospel says Jesus did it all on the cross and there is nothing you can do but believe and humbly receive. No, no, no. Surely, surely something is needed. Surely hours of meditation is required. Surely acts of self-deprecation. Surely sacrifices of penance and devotion. Surely some elaborate ceremony is needed. Some holy words to be spoken over me. Some holy rites to be performed. Naaman had come all this way, but his spirit still wasn't yet fully broken and open. A spark of faith had caused him to go to his boss, the king, and ask permission to seek healing from Yahweh. He traveled 700 miles to Jehoram with four and a half million dollars in tow. And then he traveled to Elisha's door, but now he's headed home in a huff until a servant pleaded with him. Faith that receives grace humbles the heart and compels us to obey God's word. At the words of his servant, Naaman reconsidered. He turned his chariot towards the Jordan River. I have to say the Jordan is perhaps the most unimpressive river I have ever seen in my life. It's narrow, it's shallow, it's muddy. In Pennsylvania, we would call it a crick. That's all it is. The rivers in Syria mentioned by Naaman are beautiful mountain rivers of clean water. Nevertheless, into the mud puddle, Naaman went. In the shallow Jordan, he likely had to kneel in order to dunk his head under the water. It was the final humiliating act and a whole string of faith risks. He was about to learn that it wasn't the water that caused his miracle but it was his humble, obedient faith. My pastor and father in the Lord was an Englishman. He always used to say to me, Glenn, water baptism is a humiliating act, so make water baptism services as dignified as possible. I was baptized at the age of nine. The day I I got baptized, I tell you the truth from my heart. I tell you the truth. Wild horses could not have kept me out of that water. I had to get baptized that moment. Because that was the case, I struggled to understand why anyone would hesitate to get baptized. I guess perhaps what comes very easily at the age of nine comes harder at the age of 39 or 49 Or 59, didn't Jesus say you have to humble yourself and become like a little child to enter the kingdom? Baptism is a humiliating act. Richard was right. It's an act of surrender. It's an act of submission and obedience. Beloved, listen to me. The Bible does not recommend that we get baptized. It commands us to be baptized. 
What must we do to be saved? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of sins and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off who will believe on Jesus. This is for somebody here. Don't be stubborn and disobey the word of God. Faith that receives grace is faith that makes the heart broken and open and humble and obedient. Seven times Naaman went down into the Jordan just as the man of God told him. Seven means total humility, total surrender, total obedience. One, two, three, four, five, six. When he came up for the seventh time, it says in Hebrew, literally, that Naaman was turned around and his skin became clean like a young boy's. You see, Naaman received more than just a healing miracle in the Jordan. Naaman's entire life was turned around just as Elisha had said. Elisha told King Jehoram, send him to me and he will know. And now he did. The miracle in the Jordan was that a Syrian general came to saving faith in the God of Israel. Faith that receives grace. Three things Naaman shows us. Faith is the believing that comes before the receiving. Faith is the believing that goes beyond all reason. And finally this. Faith is the believing that is focused on God pleasing Faith is the believing that's focused on God pleasing. Elated, Naaman took his whole convoy back to Elisha's door. This time, Elisha met face to face with Naaman. You see, before the miracle, Elisha needed Naaman to know that Elisha had nothing to do with it. That this was a transaction directly between God and Naaman. Elisha refused to direct any attention to himself and distract from God. Elisha refused to be the star. Only God is the star. Faith that receives grace is personal. It's a direct transaction between us and God. Though someone might help us through it, though someone might offer us words or or help us through a prayer, there is a moment of believing that we are all on our own like Naaman in the Jordan. And in that moment, there's a direct connection between our human spirit and the spirit of God. And we experience his power and his presence overflowing us. Faith that receives grace makes a clear confession. Naaman said to Elisha, now I know. Elisha said, send him to me and he will know. And Naaman says, now I know that there is no God in all the world except the God of Israel. Faith that receives grace confesses that Jesus is is Lord. Faith that receives grace doesn't say, well, Jesus is the way for me. It says Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. Faith that receives grace says salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given unto men by which we must be saved but the name of Jesus. In joyful gratitude, Naaman urged Elisha to take a gift. But Elisha would have none of it. Elisha could have really used the money. And not to line his own pockets. He was the president of a Bible school that was really struggling and needed financial help. But Elisha was a non-profit prophet. He wanted to leave no room for doubt in the mind of Naaman or Ben-Hadad. This was not a miracle that was bought and paid for. This was a miracle of grace. Faith that receives grace makes people into lifelong worshipers. Since Naaman was indebted to God for this grace he received, there was only one other thing he could do. He asked for a load of soil to take back to Syria as much as two donkeys could carry. You you see, earlier that day, he had no use for Israel and its dirty river. Now it was to him holy ground. Faith that receives grace 
changes the way we see everything. People that we once despised, those holy rollers, they're now our brothers and sisters and places of worship we once regarded as pointless are now to us beloved holy places where we long to stay. Naaman took the soil home with him so that he could kneel on a holy ground and worship the God of Israel every day for the rest of his life. You see, paying for a miracle would have been to get off easy. Now he was forever a debtor to grace. Faith that receives grace wrestles with the tension of being in this world, but not of this world. Somebody listen, because there's a word of this for you. Before he goes home, Naaman asks Elisha about how to handle one sticky situation. As the king's right-hand man, Naaman was required to accompany Ben-Hadad to the temple of Rimmon on certain state occasions. Naaman said to Elisha, the king leans on my hand and I'm required to go with him. Naaman said, may the Lord forgive me for this. You see, Naaman's heart was sold out to Yahweh, but his position, the the position that he got by the favor of God, required him to do some things that he didn't want to do. It, It was by God's favor that he became the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And now he had to do some things that bothered his spirit. Now he had to do some things that didn't sit right with his conscience. And it's no different for us living and working in this world. There are times that we have to do some things that we don't like. Sometimes we have to quietly roll our eyes while someone leans on our hand and bows down to an idol that we know is completely impotent. And we can't wait to get out of there and get back to the holy ground where we worship the God we adore who saved us by his amazing grace. Elisha's answer to Naaman was go in peace. Go in shalom. Go in the wholeness that comes from being in covenant with Yahweh. Have peace. Naaman, you're right with God now. And his peace will lead you forward in how to live in this tension of being in this world yet not of this world. Paul wrote the same thing to the Colossians when he wrote, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. The word is umpire. Let the peace of God umpire in your hearts. In other words, let the peace of God help you make the call as you live in this tension of being in this world and not of this world. What is faith that receives grace? Faith that receives grace believes before it receives. Faith that receives grace believes beyond all reason. It it, it makes the spirit broken and open. It makes the heart humble and obedient to the word of God. It's faith that is focused on God pleasing. It makes a clear confession of Christ. It makes us lifelong worshipers of Christ. And it helps us live in the tension of being in this world, but not of this world. The congregation at Nazareth, they wanted to see a miracle and then believe. But Naaman, he believed and so saw his miracle. Be like Naaman. Make it a good church day and believe. Would you stand on your feet and give Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, a great big praise in this place?